Yorktown. Even today, over 240 years later, the name can still send patriotic shivers down the spine. It was here, in a small settlement on the coast of Virginia, that American and French troops won one of the most important battles in world history. A battle that not only ended the active phase of the American Revolutionary War, but also guaranteed the United States would be freed, at last, from the tea-stained shackles of the British Empire. For Americans, this is sacred grounds, a place every school kid hears about, the tale of Washington's victory and Cornwallis' surrender etched into the national psyche. But there is far more to the Battle of Yorktown than the story of a simple victory. The culmination of over six years of conflict, Yorktown came at a time when all the war's major players were exhausted, from the Americans to the British to the French. Everyone in 1781 understood the necessity of a decisive blow. Yet it was only by coincidence that this blow ultimately fell where it did. In today's video, Warrior Graphics is delving into the final battle of the Revolutionary War and trying to comprehend how this one defeat came to collapse all of Britain's American dreams. As 1781 dawns on the North American continent, it was not a young nation flush with patriotism, but on an exhausted land ravaged by war. The Revolutionary War that had broken out so spectacularly in 1775 was now entering its sixth year with still no end in sight. On the one hand, the British had been unable to quash the rebellion and were stuck holding a handful of coastal cities. On the other, the continental forces were racking up eye-watering debts and suffering increasing problems of low morale. In short, it was a stalemate, one in which none of today's main players were having anything remotely like a good time. Down in the south, General Charles Cornwallis was leading a British force that was supposed to be pacifying the Carolinas, but was really just kind of wearing itself out. For a year now, the general had been moving methodically south to north, taking towns and garrisoning them with redcoats. They'd logged great victories like the Battle of Camden and lesser victories like the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. But while on paper, Cornwallis's force was smashing it in the Carolinas, on the grounds, it was really more just pathetically limping along like a lazy, wounded deer. The plan had been that pro-British locals would rise up to support them only for the locals to instead be all like, uh, <laughs> no thanks bro, you can keep your war beer and your milky tea. <laughs> ah. Guerrilla attacks and disease had depleted their ranks. On top of that, those victories that Cornwallis kept scoring were only victories in the Pyrrhic sense. The Battle of Guildford Courthouse, for example, had seen the general lose a quarter of his men, and even these wins were in danger of being undone. That April, Cornwallis's opponent, Major General Nathaniel Green, would launch a successful invasion of South Carolina, flushing the British garrison out of Camden. Cornwallis's Carolina adventure then was gaining him little more than a bunch of tired and pissed off men. Yet the British general wasn't the only one suffering. Way up in the north, George Washington was also dealing with discontent in the ranks. As 1781 began, the British under Henry Clinton were sitting tight in New York, from where the Continental Army had been unable to dislodge them. With the stalemate grinding on, the early romanticism of the war had given way to cold misery and feelings of mutiny. As food ran out that freezing January and soldiers' pay again failed to arrive, not even Washington could stop anger spreading like a grumpy wildfire. On January the 1st, over a thousand soldiers revolted. While some speedy negotiations and even speedier executions stopped the mutiny growing, it didn't solve the root problems. Just a short while later, another 200 men rose up. This time, Washington was so worried about his eroding authority that he refused to even attempt negotiations. More executions quelled the mutiny for now, but it was clear that morale was nearing collapse. And this reflected a broader problem that the Americans were facing. The Continental Congress was running out of cash. While Benjamin Franklin had succeeded in scaring up more loans from France, they were not going to last forever. And speaking of France, now would be a good time to mention that French forces also began 1781 feeling trapped. In their case, literally. Back in July of 1780, a French fleet under the Comte de Rochambeau had landed at Newport, Rhode Island with 7,000 troops to reinforce the Americans. But then the Royal Navy had blockaded the port and now they were stuck. Rochambeau was unwilling to march overland to hook up with Washington and leave his fleet at the mercy 
of these limey douchebags. As 1781 began then, this was the state of play. Cornwallis and Washington's armies on the verge of mass desertion. Rochambeau stuck in Newport. Henry Clinton stuck in New York. And America running out of money. Even Britain itself was suffering, with the Spanish and Dutch officially joining France in an anti-London alliance. What every player knew this game urgently needed then was a bold move. A decisive action that would break the stalemate and maybe even this damn war before it sucked them all dry. But who would be the one to make it? The answer, it would soon turn out, is everybody. The breaking of the 1781 stalemate was sort of like a dam collapsing. At first, it was just little cracks appearing in this great edifice of inertia. But those little cracks quickly multiplied until the whole facade suddenly disintegrated. The first little crack? A storm over Rhode Island. That January Mother Nature went to town on Newport. As the winds howled, the British blockade was scattered, freeing the French fleet. This in turn freed up Rochambeau to finally haul ass and go hook up with George Washington's forces. Even with the blockade of the French fleet over, though, it didn't initially seem like much had changed. Washington did try to make use of the new ships, dispatching them down to Virginia, where the traitor Benedict Arnold, or as we British call him, the brave, heroic, and damn handsome Benedict Arnold, had captured Portsmouth. But even with the blockade broken, the Royal Navy was still the Royal Navy, and not for nothing does the old song go, rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves. The British fleet raced south, beating the French to Portsmouth and establishing control over Chesapeake Bay. Yet while this was a blow to everyone who wasn't a limey, it was only the first crack in the dam, and others were already appearing, spreading over the frozen war like thin threads of a spiderweb. Even as the British were winning the race to Chesapeake Bay, a second fleet was setting out from France under the control of François-Joseph Paul de Grasse. Comprising 28 ships of the line, 7 frigates and 2 cutters, it was simply one of the most powerful naval forces to yet enter the war. And the best part? With the Royal Navy in Europe tied up defending Britain from Spanish and Dutch invasions, de Grasse could cross the Atlantic unbothered. By April 1781, his huge fleet had reached the Caribbean. The next major crack came on the British side. Down in the Carolinas, Charles Cornwallis was fed up, with Nathaniel Green attacking British garrisons, with the plummeting morale of his men, and most of all, with that pig-headed Clinton insisting he keep fighting this grim war of attrition in the South. In fact, Cornwallis was so fed up on that last point that he wrote to Henry Clinton and basically said, Yo, your Carolinas suck. I'm gonna march into Virginia, hmm? Cornwallis' idea was to establish a base on Chesapeake Bay. When he and his exhausted men arrived in Virginia in May, well, that's exactly what they did. Taking over commands from the dashingly sexy Benedict Arnold, Cornwallis led their combined armies to make a base at Petersburg, Virginia, a town with river access to the bay, but not one where they'd have their backs pinned against a vast body of water. But then Clinton wrote back, being all like, all right, go to Virginia. But you've got to make base at either Williamsburg or Yorktown. I'm the boss, and you've got to do what I say. For Cornwallis, it was like a choice between stubbing your toe or slamming your nuts in a drawer. With a heavy heart, he began preparing a base at Yorktown. It was at this point that the growing cracks finally started to break the edifice of stalemate apart. Yorktown today sits pleasingly close to a community called Achilles, and Achilles' heel is exactly what it was, an exposed weak point that no amount of British armor could properly defend. Up in the north, Rochambeau seems to have been the first to recognize this. He began pressing Washington, saying they should march their combined force down to Virginia. But for whatever reason, Washington just flat out refused. With Henry Clinton still occupying New York, Washington was sure that this was the point of attack. He even tried to get Rochambeau to order the new French fleet under de Grasse to sail upwards and help. Luckily, though, de Grasse wasn't having it. With Chesapeake Bay both closer and more navigable, the French admiral put his Gaelic foot down. He and his fleet were heading to Virginia. When the news reached him, Washington did the only thing he could. He caved, agreeing to follow Rochambeau's advice. The bold, decisive move everyone had been waiting for would now take place at Yorktown. For all Washington may have been against attacking Yorktown, he pretty quickly got into the spirit of the plan. His first stroke of genius was to convince Clinton he was about to attack New York, tying up all potential British reinforcements. Now, this was 
pretty easy to do, just as Washington had Clinton himself considered New York City the big prize, the win the Continentals would obviously want. Still, Washington went above and beyond to hoodwink him, having his men build a camp with gigantic bread ovens, exactly the sort of thing that he'd do if he was preparing a siege. He then signed papers declaring his intent to attack, only to be like, oh no! Those papers accidentally fell into the hands of my enemies! How did that happen? Oh no! By mid-August, the British were sure that an assault on New York City was imminent. Clinton even began refusing Cornwallis's pleas for reinforcements on the grounds that they were needed in the North. It's here that we get to Washington's second stroke of genius, the first march to Yorktown. Leaving behind a few men to keep up the appearance of a coming attack, Washington took the bulk of his army into New Jersey. There they linked up with the French force from Newport, then marched 450 miles south in a mere three weeks. It was a staggering feat of logistics, one that gave Clinton no time to figure out that he was being tricked. But it wasn't the only impressive troop movement going on. Down in the Caribbean, de Grasse was hauling his 37 ships north to Chesapeake Bay. Since the Royal Navy fleet under Admiral Hood was patrolling the high seas, that meant taking a sneaky roundabout route via the Bahamas. But this long route wound up being a blessing in disguise. Realizing de Grasse's fleet was on the move, Admiral Hood gave chase, sailing full pelt up to Chesapeake Bay. The trouble was, he sailed so fast that he overtook the French fleet without realizing. So, when he arrived at the French Free Bay, he was all like, well, they must be attacking New York. He gathered up the British ships already there and zoomed north. That meant de Grasse's ships could enter Chesapeake Bay unmolested on August the 25th. And that may have been the difference between our world and the one where Yorktown is shorthand for amazing British victory. Once it reached New York, pretty much everyone figured out what had happened. Now under Admiral Graves and with additional ships, the British fleet turned around and headed back down to Virginia. On September 5th, 1781, Graves' 19 ships of the line arrived in Chesapeake Bay, and so began one of the most important naval battles in human history. Known alternately as the Battle of the Capes and, less imaginatively, the Battle of Chesapeake Bay, the fight nearly began with a massive French up when they sighted the ships and assumed that they were the other French fleet from Newport. It was only when the British were practically on top of them that de Grasse realized what a doofus had been and scrambled his ships into action. Thankfully, Admiral Graves held back from entering the bay, giving the French time to organize into a line. By 4.15 p.m., the two fleets were facing one another, but with the British at a disadvantage with the wind's direction, Graves' last ships were not yet in position. Like their roast beef opponents, though, the French weren't willing to wait. The battle began with a volley of cannon fire. For the next two hours, the fleets unleashed hell on one another. When the concussive noise of the heavy guns finally died, the French had two ships knocked out of the fight. The British, by contrast, had lost six ships and over 300 men. The Battle of the Capes was over. While Graves would try returning with his remaining ships on September the 13th, the French fleet from Newport would have arrived by then, taking de Grasse's total number of ships to, well, roughly a bazillion. Outnumbered, outgunned, and frankly outclassed, the British fleet slunk away. And with that, control of the waters near Yorktown was handed to the French and Americans. As Royal Navy historian Michael Lewis would write of the events that day, the Battle of Chesapeake Bay was one of the decisive battles of the world. Before it, the creation of the United States of America was possible. After it, it was certain. Now, all that was left to do was wait for fate to take its course. As the last days of September 1781 drew to a close in Virginia, they did so on a British garrison that was both trapped and desperately outnumbered. Charles Cornwallis could count under his command around 8,000 men, a number dwarfed by the 16,000 French and Americans under Washington. Realizing the danger, the general wrote to Henry Clinton, begging for reinforcements. Clinton replied that ships would leave New York on October the 5th. Sadly for Cornwallis, he apparently forgot to leave out the half-sniggered not at the end. There would be no ships coming on the 5th, or the 6th, or really at all. Cornwallis and his men were on their own. Still, the British hadn't exactly been caught with their pants down. As the American French force approached on September the 28th, it was toward a series of earthen siege lines and redoubts, polygonal forts with tangles of branches at their feet to trip up attackers, and sharp wooden stakes, known as phrases, hammered into their sides. A direct 
daylight charge against such lines would be suicide. Luckily, Washington already had a far better plan in mind. Under the direction of French engineers, the Continentals began digging a series of parallel trenches around the British position, effectively trapping them within a perimeter line. By October the 9th, the parallels had brought the line so close that the Brits were now in range of artillery. That same day, the French heavy guns began firing, raining shells onto Cornwallis's forces. American guns joined too, with Washington personally lighting the touch paper on the first cannon to fire. It was the beginning of a full week of British misery. The artillery assault was relentless, pounding their lines day after day, causing destruction, death, damaging morale. On the 11th, Washington's men began digging a new parallel, bringing them even closer to Yorktown. But this time, there was a snag. Two redoubts, known as 9 and 10, blocked the new trench from being completed. Unable to cut the British off, Washington realized that he had no choice but to take the redoubts with an infantry charge. It would be bloody, it would be dangerous. Unbeknownst to anyone, it would also become one of the great set-piece moments in the Battle of Yorktown. Across the 13th and the 14th of October, redoubts 9 and 10 were pummeled by artillery. As the guns blasted away, Washington laid out the plan. 400 French under General Baron de Villemenil would attack redoubt 9, while 400 Americans under the Marquis de Lafayette would launch a simultaneous attack on number 10. At the last minute, Alexander Hamilton went to Washington to complain that he should be the one leading the American troops into battle. The general granted his wish. The sun set that day on a battlefield shrouded in mist. In the American trenches, a combined force of 800 Continentals and French waited, breath held, for the signal. Because the plan called for a surprise assault, no one had been allowed to load their weapons. After pioneers with axes smashed a hole through the redoubt's defenses, the fighting would all be done with bayonets. After all, one accidental gunshot was all it would take to give the game away. Shortly before 7 p.m., attacks were made on the British flank, but these were just diversions, a show to draw Cornwallis' attention. The real action would be at the redoubts. The moment the hour struck, six guns fired the signal. As one, 800 men surged out, flooding across no man's land to meet their destiny. At redoubt 10, the British heard the pioneers get to work and rushed to open fire on the Americans. But artillery had already smashed holes in their defenses as British muskets cracked in the dark. Someone shouted, Rush on, boys! And then the Americans were pouring in, whooping, hollering, ready to fight. And a fight was exactly what they'd get. The assault was brutal. Grenades were dropped into the mass of American soldiers. Atop the parapet, hand-to-hand -hand combat took place with bayonets, rifle butts, anything that came to hand. The British had the high grounds, but in the end they were no match for the 400 attackers. Redoubt 10 fell less than 15 minutes after the assault began. By then, nine Americans and eight British were dead, with dozens more wounded. But the deed was done. Roughly a quarter of an hour later, Redoubt 9 also fell. There, the French had endured heavy musket fire as their pioneers worked to break the wooden defenses. Fifteen had died, and over seventy had been injured. But for all the bloodshed, it was now over. The British had been overwhelmed. Their last vital points of defense had fallen. There was only one way Yorktown could end now. With the redoubts in American and French hands, the final parallel could be finished. This meant the British were now just 300 yards from the artillery. If they thought the last week had been miserable, they hadn't seen anything yet. Cornwallis seems to have realized this. The day after the redoubts fell, he rolled everything on a last desperate counterattack. But, well, here's the thing about desperate counterattacks. They only rarely work. And Charles Cornwallis had neither the skill nor the luck to count his final assault among their number. The morning of October the 17th dawned to the faint sounds of a lone drum being played. From their position, the Americans watched as a British drummer boy walked to the front of Cornwallis' lines, followed by an officer holding a white handkerchief. The two were taken behind lines where they delivered the exciting, inevitable news. Cornwallis wanted to surrender. Now, the actual process of surrendering dragged on interminably, involving a series of letters being hand-carried back and forth between Washington and Cornwallis. But minutes before midnight on October the 18th, a deal was finalized. There would be no revenge, no brutalization of the losers. Instead, the Brits would be divided into smaller units and sent to prison camps under the watch of their officers. Provisions were made for the treatment of the wounded, and the rights of the officer class would be respected. 
But there was one major ask from Cornwallis that Washington refused to grant. In this era, it was customary to allow defeated troops to surrender while marching under their regimental flags. This was considered the honorable way to lose a battle. Back in 1780, though, the British had defeated the Americans during a siege at Charlestown. Today, Charleston and an honorable surrender had been refused. So when Cornwallis asked, Washington's simple reply was, the same honors will be granted to the surrendering army as given to the garrison of Charlestown. The next day, the formal surrender took place outside Yorktown. Determined to somehow repay Washington's snub, Cornwallis ordered his men to ignore the American forces as they marched out, instead looking only to the French, as if to signify that Washington couldn't have won without Paris's support. And while that's probably true, it was still a total move. Yet, it was also one that likely granted Cornwallis only limited satisfaction. At the end of the day, it was the Americans who took his sword. And it was the Americans who'd benefit the most from his final defeat. Not that there was anything necessarily final about Yorktown. When Yorktown fell, there were still roughly 30,000 British troops in North America. New York was occupied, as were Savannah and Charlestown. The damaged but still dangerous Royal Navy fleet patrolled the waters. In other words, the British could probably have fought on for God knows how much longer. But while that may have been possible in a practical sense, politically, it was just a non-starter. With Cornwallis's defeat, a third of Britain's forces had been captured. France, Spain, and the Dutch were menacing the empire's other territories in India, Gibraltar, and the West Indies. To continue the fight in America meant losing more troops that London could better deploy elsewhere. On top of that, a strong peace faction had emerged in the British Parliament, led by Lord Rockingham and his Whigs. They were sympathetic to the American cause. Yorktown, then, had been that decisive blow everyone needed and the British knew it. When he received word of Cornwallis' defeat, Prime Minister Lord North cried, Oh God, it is all over. The following spring, on March 5, 1782, Parliament voted to end the war. Fifteen days later, Lord North resigned, handing power to Rockingham and the Whigs. At this point, you might be dimly recalling stuff that you learned about the Revolutionary War in school and wondering why, if Yorktown effectively ended the fighting, the war's end date isn't the 19th of October 1781, or even the 20th of March 1782 when Lord North resigned, but rather September 1783. The trouble is, with this many players, there was still a whole bunch of closing moves to be made to wrap up play so that everyone was satisfied. And doing so would take the best part of two whole years. As 1782 began, there were three immediate obstacles to pursuing peace. The first was King George III, whose attitude to Yorktown was less, forsooth, I have lost, but fairly, and more, keep fighting, we will crush the rebel scum. It was only when Rockingham point blank refused to form a government unless peace was signed that the king caved, but this quickly led to the second obstacle. Long in ill health, Lord Rockingham died on the 1st of July 1782 after a career in which he'd constantly advocated for the Americans. So, goodbye, Rockingham. You were a crucial part of the war's endgame, yet hardly anybody remembers you. Sorry about that. Although Rockingham's death slowed things up, he was soon replaced by Lord Shelburne, and negotiations between the Brits and the Americans finally began in Paris. By November 1792, they'd reached an agreement. And this is when things ran smack into the third obstacle. Because America had needed outside help to fight the war, the Continental Congress had signed a treaty with France stipulating that peace with Britain couldn't be agreed until London and Paris had negotiated their own treaty. Unfortunately, Paris had then signed a similar treaty with Spain, meaning the Revolutionary War couldn't end until both Paris and Madrid agreed that it could. And by late 1782, the Zanias were far more interested in conquering Gibraltar than sitting down to talk. That means everyone had to sit and wait while the results from the rock became clear. And when it turned out that Britain had won, that meant everyone going back to the negotiating table as London demanded more favorable terms. It wasn't until January the 20th, 1783, that a peace agreement was settled on, but even then, the wait wasn't over. There was still a separate peace for the British to agree with the Dutch. As that was being concluded, Lord North managed to somehow come back from the dead like a bloated, bewigged Emperor Palpatine, throw the Whigs out of power, and forge an unstable coalition that further gummed up the works. Yet for all these political shenanigans, the defeat at Yorktown had ensured that a final peace favorable to the Americans was inevitable. On June the 20th, two British and French fleets fought what is now considered the final battle of the Revolutionary War, not in the Americas, but off the coast of Calore 
in India. Finally, on September 3, 1783, the treaties ending the war were ratified. Nearly three months later, on November 25, the last British troops were evacuated from U.S. soil. The Empire's claim on America was finished. And it was all thanks to Yorktown. Today, of course, the Battle of Yorktown is still iconic, the acknowledged end of the Revolutionary War and a triumph for Washington and his forces. In that sense, perhaps making a video on it was almost unnecessary. After all, how much suspense can there be when everybody knows the ending? Yet, even if its name is everywhere, there's still a lot we can learn from the story of Yorktown, not just from the famous heroics, but also the lesser-known aspects, the context from which it arose, the underrated Battle of the Capes, knowing why, exactly, Cornwallis's loss had such an impact. If we've done our job today, hopefully ended this video perhaps not having heard about Yorktown for the first time, but at least with a deeper appreciation of what went on here and why it was so important. Because make no mistake, this was one of the most important battles in the histories of both America and Britain. The moment when the United States finally broke free of its colonial overlord for good. As such, it's also a battle that deserves to be remembered for all eternity. Hope you found today's video interesting. If you did, please do hit that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And thank you for watching.